Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jalen and today I have my October reading wrap up in which I'm going to talk about the eight books that I finished in October. I also DNF'd one, Chunky Boy, but we'll get to that later. Um, today is November 1st and I'm always quite sad on this day. I love overcast weather, but it's like adding to my sadness of the spooky season being over. I feel like people just generally dismiss Halloween in October, like when the clock strikes midnight and it does not sit well with my spirit. Halloween store. Um, <laughs> but I will keep the spooky reads going into November because I have two that I'm working on that are still spooky. So I will keep the horror vibes going, at least on this channel, which will be fun. But anyways, let's get into the eight books that I read in October. I also found one of my new favorite books of the year. For, like, when I finished it, I thought it was my favorite book that I read so far this year. I don't know where it'll land by the end of the year, but anyways, we will see. So first one is Mother Thing by Ainsley Hogarth. And this is an author that I had on my podcast as well. And this has kind of been like the it book of October for like literary horror fans. And I really, really enjoyed it. And also our conversation was excellent. She was really, really kind and funny. We talked about housewives and the horrors of domesticity, which this book dabbles in, I must say, to a significant degree. So this book follows a couple, Abby and Ralph, and Abby's mother-in-law, or Ralph's mother, has committed suicide upon the book's opening, and she begins haunting this couple. And this book gradually reveals itself to be one that dabbles in like the unhinged woman trope of Abby getting more and more fixated on being the best wife she can be, also wanting to be a mother. And we learn more about her past and her fraught relationship with her own mother and how that trauma has bled over into her current moment of trying to save Ralph from the depths of depression that his mother suffered from and just trying to be the best wife and potential mother that she can be. And in addition, she works at a nursing home in which she cares for an older woman named Mrs. Bondi. And that relationship, she starts to think of Mrs. Bondi, who is an older woman, as her child in a sense as well. And once Mrs. Bondi's daughter says that she's going to take Mrs. Bondi out of that nursing home, things spiral further. And this book is incredibly entertaining. It has one of my favorite endings in recent memory. I was... So surprised with where, where it goes, and it's kind of like darkly funny. It's really, it'll gross you out a little bit. I just really enjoyed the sort of use of horror and like the domestic framework, it's something I really enjoy. Like, for example, I love the movie Hereditary, and I think if you liked that movie, or if you even liked Jeanette McCurdy's book, I'm Glad My Mom Died, I think this is one that you'll really enjoy too, with like similar themes going on. But yeah, I really liked it, and if you want to hear more about it, I have my interview with Ainsley Hogarth. We're pretty much spoiler free in that discussion too. So if you're intrigued, I would definitely check that out. And yeah, so that's that one. First Love by Gwendolyn Riley. This is a book I've been incredibly excited to read for a while now. Um, but then I saw the New York Review of Books. They recently reissued them with new covers. And I saw a bunch of new critical pieces on her two books, First Love and My Phantoms. And all of that response to her books made me super excited to read them. And I'm so glad I've read one so far. I think I'm gonna read My Phantoms this month as well because I really enjoyed this. So basically this is a novel that follows a marriage that is quite toxic. So in the first few pages, we meet Nev or Neve, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name. And she is with Edwin, and it seems to start that the relationship is quite supportive. They are quite, you know, in love with each other. They give each other nicknames. Like things are appearing to be quite swell. And then there's this one passage in which Gwendolyn Riley, within like three or four lines, completely flips that on its head and makes you realize that this relationship is actually quite toxic. And I think it's quite representative of the very sort of abrupt or kind of odd feeling of kind of being swept off of your feet in a love, whether that be in a good way or a bad way, how you can sort of be blindsided by a relationship going sour and you're not really sure why that is. And so the rest of the book is Nev trying to think back on her prior relationships with other men and then also with her father and her mother. All of them have been quite fraught and she's trying to think about whether the problem is her or is it Edwin or is it a factor of her past trauma with these other relationships and whether her and Edwin will make it. But I will say this book is very, very, very heavy on verbal abuse, particularly in the last half. Nev and Edwin, a lot of their conversations or a lot of the plot of this book is their discussions with each other and Edwin sort of placing blame on Nev for certain behaviors in the past and his like hyper fixation on her past behavior. And so 
all that to say, this is a book about domestic abuse and thinking about a character who's not really sure how she got where she is and what that means for her going forward. I really, really enjoyed this as a very like minute, very focused study into a marriage. I really like books like that. For example, Jonathan Franzen, I think does that really well too, but I think this book is incredibly short as well. So it's a very pacey, quick, reflective and just places you right in the middle in the thick of this marriage. I really, really like this. And I'm curious to see what My Phantoms is all about. I don't even know what it's about. I think it's more so about a family drama rather than like a marriage, but I don't know. I guess we will see. Next up, I have All This Could Be Different by Sarah Thuncombe Matthews. This is a book that was recently shortlisted or as a finalist for the National Book Award, which is really cool. I've been seeing this book everywhere and I really like this book. It follows a young queer Indian immigrant who is living in Milwaukee and she is trying to make her way, trying to find love, dealing with friendship, trying to find a career in Milwaukee and the sort of kind of amalgamation of all of those things and trying to find community and purpose. And so I think if you liked the book Memorial by Brian Washington, I think that is a very like direct comparison I can make here in terms of like tone and sort of pacing and plotting and character development. They feel very similar to me in terms of looking at contemporary queer relationship dynamics. But then this book is also looking at the idea of home and housing while looking at, you know, at the recession and also having a lot of subplots that deal with homes and housing and trying to think about those questions while also looking at identity and queerness and is basically just telling the story of a woman who is quite what's the word i guess she fits like in the unlikable woman trope i guess but i think she is likable i just think that sarah thunka matthews does a really good job at portraying her and all of her brutal honesty in terms of her thoughts about people, her trying to think about contemporary, like political, socio political issues, and her confusion about them and trying to find her own place as a young 20 something year old. So, yeah, I think if you like contemporary queer fiction that follows a love story at its core, but is also looking at friendships and just the fraught trying to find yourself coming of age story, I think you'll really like this book too. Next, I have All's Well by Mona Awad. This I read because I had Mona Awad on my podcast, and her novel Bunny has been one of my all-time favorite books since I read it back in 2019. And so in preparation for this interview, I read her latest, which is just re-released in paperback. And this book is really interesting. It is exploring the idea of theater and performance while also looking at chronic pain. So we follow a woman who is a teacher at a college, and she is the director, I believe, of the theater program. And she wants to put on a production of All's Well That Ends Well by Shakespeare, and her students want Macbeth. And underlying all of that, she is also dealing with chronic pain after suffering from a fall during a performance. And so no one really believes her about her chronic pain. She's trying to find a solution to it. And then basically what ensues from there is she meets these three guys at a bar, Shakespeare Illusion, and that sort of helps her kind of heal from her chronic pain. And then the fallout that ensues once she puts on the performance of All's Well and how that all plays out for her in terms of transferring, in a sense, her pain to someone else, one of her enemies, and all of that, and the big production that kind of falls out from there. I just really enjoy Mona Awad's using art as sort of like the through line in her fiction, at least in her last two books, of thinking about the idea of performance, looking at narrators that are quite isolated or lonely or going through something personally in their own minds, in their interiority, and then having to put them in another collegiate atmosphere in which they have to interact with other people and how that kind of plays out for them. I think she uses magical realism to explore those questions in really fun and interesting, creepy and surprising ways that I'm always like, incredibly entertained by her books and I just really love her mind. Our discussion was so, so good. She was just like the coolest, so nice. She teaches at Syracuse University, and I want to take her classes. She focuses on horror classes. I think she has one on villains as well, she said. And so just her brain and like her preoccupations in fiction are something that I feel very inclined to also read myself. So I just feel like I'm very tied to her as an author, and I'm very excited to read her next book, which comes out in September of 2023, which sounds really good. It's called Rogue. So keep an eye out for that one as well. But yeah, that was all as well. Next up, I have Seven Empty Houses by Samantha Schweblin. This is a collection that really took me by surprise. It was another book I picked up for Spooky Season. I had previously read her novels, Fever Dream and Little Eyes. This is back in, I think, 2019 and 2020, and I didn't really love them. I was a little 
feeling like mid on both of them. And so this collection, I was a little nervous to pick up, but I wanted to try a short story collection. And these ones were rooted in domesticity per the synopsis. So I was like, you know what? Let me give her one more shot. It's a quick little story collection. Let's see what she's giving. And I love this collection. I think she is a really smart and interesting writer who uses reader expectation to her advantage. Every story that you read of hers in this collection is focusing on, I guess, horrors or questions or the sort of terror of being in a home and thinking about this sort of psychological mind space of living in a home and how she can kind of play with the mind in that setting was really interesting. There's a story at the core of this collection that's like 82 pages and it reminded me so much, like very, very much of my favorite Otessa Moshek book, Death in Her Hands, in terms of having an older narrator, not really knowing whether she's reliable, weird things going on in and around her house. Like it was just so similar to that book. And I think it's interesting how she's using from the title Seven Empty Houses. I think she allows the reader to fill with their own assumptions or preoccupations, their own projection onto each story. She doesn't answer everything for you. Things are kind of weird. You're not really sure the truth of what's going on in the story, but having your own kind of reader's response to what's going on kind of helps the reader also play as a vital force in each of her stories that I think is really fulfilling and interesting. While it can make it seem like there might be something missing to the story or it could leave you just purely confused, she has enough in the story to make it kind of stand on its own. But there's enough to also kind of leave you feeling weird and haunted after them that you're constantly thinking about like what she was trying to do with the story, what your own assumptions were about what she was telling you, kind of what gaps there are there. I think there are stories that are meant to be reread and so I'm definitely gonna be doing that as well. So yeah, I loved it. And now I wanna go back and revisit her other stuff because I really like this one. So my favorite of the month, hands down, it is The English Understand Wool by Helen DeWitt. This is an author that's been on my list, my TBR list for quite a while. And New Directions just published this storybook series in which they are publishing these little storybooks that have a short story, like a novella length uh, piece of fiction in them. And it's supposed to be like a replication of a childhood storybook where you can just read it in one afternoon, but told for adults. And so this little short story how do I summarize it? I think this book is best if you go into it blind in a sense. So I'll kind of leave the plot synopsis. We follow this woman who is incredibly wealthy and she learned the sort of ideas of etiquette from her mother. They live in Morocco. The book is considering at the start the ideas of bad taste and trying to avoid bad taste in every aspect of one's life. And then from there, basically something happens to our narrator that kind of flips all of her expectations on her head or so you would think something traumatic happens but the narrator's response to the trauma or the revelation of her life doesn't affect her in the way that you think it will she's incredibly funny she's a cunning ingenious narrator so smart and from the trauma she gets a book deal and the rest of the story is about her writing her story about what happened to her and other people in publishing want her to tell a certain type of story about the trauma that unfolded in her life and she's not falling into that trap of trying to sell the book in the way that they want her to and what plays out from there is just a romp of contract law of her sort of manipulating the system in a way of her always being one step ahead of publishing with the background that she received from her mother being able to see through people's bullshit essentially. And it was just so fun to read a narrator who was so smart. And there were like two instances in the story where I laughed out loud and like the last like 20 to 30 pages, I was like giggling. Like I was, I was reading it and like, I was like shaking the book a little bit. Like I was like, this is so fucking good. Like I, it was so rare for me to find a book where I was just like grinning at how smart it is, how fun it is how it plays with its form in a really interesting way. It was just so self-aware and meta and the narrator was fucking amazing. Like it was just such a fun reading experience that I highly implore you all to pick it up. Hopefully that synopsis gives you enough to know what it's about. But other than that, I would not look up anything about this book and let me know what you think of it if you do pick it up. It's a very quick breezy read. I think it's like 69 pages. I can see it being in my top five at least of the year. I fucking loved it. Anyways, that was that. And then finally, I finished Freedom by Jonathan. Oh, I have two more. I finished Freedom by Jonathan Franzen. This is a book that I've been reading for quite a while. I picked this one up over the summer and read like 20% of it. 
you know, I was reading a ton of stuff at the time and I just couldn't like commit to a long book for some reason. But then I finally picked this back up. I refreshed my memory and I finished it. And I really, really like this book. I love Jonathan Franzen as is well documented on this channel. I think he is the master of family dramas and I like his sort of eccentric oddities in his storytelling that is so signature Franzen. It's really fun finding writers that kind of feel so distinctly themselves. I would say him and also Tessa Moshfeg are two of my favorite writers for that reason. I feel like when you pick up their books, you just know that it's them writing it. And every time they take you on just an incredible story and, and following characters that are incredibly complex. And I just love the kind of the way that they use they use like their sort of signature style in every novel that they undergo. And so basically this one follows Walter and Patty Berglund. They are a couple who are living in a suburb and essentially upon the novel's opening, the neighborhood that they once lived in is reflecting on sort of what happened to them after the New York Times headline comes out that Walter got himself involved in some bad business. And it seems kind of odd given his political leanings. And from there, what ensues is a breakdown of Patty and Walter's past from childhood to the present, thinking about their loyalties to each other, why they're married, very fraught aspects in their relationships. I will, it's not really a spoiler to say that a lot of affairs occur in this book. Patty has a lust, a strong lust for Walter's best friend growing up and how that sort of consummates itself later in life, how that all plays out. Walter has his own issues um, and also deals with their kids as well and how their loyalties to their parents are sort of fraught given those dynamics. Patty has an extensive history with her own parents I'm rambling about this book, but basically we follow these characters that are fully fleshed out and thinking about their motivations in a particular political climate. This book was published in 2010, and so I feel like a lot of Franzen's political anger shines through significantly in this book in light of it being published around that time. And so a lot of the novel's plot is dealing with those issues as well as climate change and thinking about the ideas of freedom, of personal freedom, what that means on a micro level with our relationships with each other. Patty and Walter have the freedom to do what they want to do, whether it be cheat on their spouse or kind of fulfill their own professional goals. But the novel is really questioning what impact does that have on people around us when we make choices for ourselves. And from that, from a macro perspective, also thinking about when we engage in certain behaviors, how does that affect the climate? How does our political leanings affect things on a macro level? This book in signature friends and form is looking at the micro, the family, to really explore these greater questions of personal freedom, particularly in America. And I think he does that really well. Walter and Patty, I don't know, I think it's really fun that in his books, they're so long, this is 600 pages, that they truly feel like real people. Like spending that much time with the character is so unique for me as I read a lot of shorter books. So it was really fun sitting with characters throughout their entire lives and seeing how they behave. It kind of feels more realistic, I guess. I think his novels, while they have their moments of oddity, I think he does tap into something incredibly true about human nature. And his use of characters that have different allegiances or different desires in their lives, putting them in conflict with each other, makes for just really fun novel reading. I think he's a really good storyteller on that front. I'm hoping to get him on the podcast because I would really love to talk to him about all these things, but fingers crossed for that. Highly recommend it. I think my current ranking of Jonathan Franzen's books, I've read three novels and one essay collection. I'll leave the essay collection separate. I think it's really strong, but I think it goes in the order that I read them. I think my favorite is Crossroads. Second favorite is The Corrections. And then last place is Freedom, but it's not because I didn't like it. I loved it. It's just strong competition with those other two. So I hear that those three books of his are his best works of fiction. So I'm a little nervous to read his older stuff because I hear from fans and non-fans alike that those books are not the best in their opinion. But I wonder if I'll be surprised by them. I don't know. I will read them at some point, but I think my next one will be Purity by him, which came out a couple years ago. And the last book that I finished this month was The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. This is a book that's been on my TBR for quite a long time. I had previously read We Have Always Lived in the Castle by her, and I really liked it. I read it like three years ago. Mona Awad, when she was on the podcast, she recommended that I read this book. She said she recently had to reread it and she loved it. She said it's so scary, uh, so good. And so I picked it up for spooky season over the weekend. And 
I really like this book. I won't say that it's one of my new favorites. I think I need to listen to some podcasts and read a little bit more about this book to kind of understand a little bit more the context for this book. And I don't know. I think this book is interesting in terms of it being published in 1959, I believe. Kind of considering how this book is sort of the blueprint for certain like haunted house and narrative frameworks in terms of a cast of characters going to a haunted house to see if something's going on in it. And as you might expect, bad shit happens to the people that go there. Um, I love that sort of trope in fiction or in horror. And this book plays with that, but it uses a more, I guess, classical framework. This book does kind of feel a little bit more timeless in its telling and its sort of ambiguity. I really like thinking about this book in terms of newer movies and novels that kind of use this form. First and foremost, her prose is immaculate. The first and last paragraph of this book is just exquisite. It is the classic, no live organism can live under conditions of absolute reality. Did I get that verbatim? I don't know if I did. She spilled with that one. We follow these four characters in Hill House, and I love how she renders Hill House as this haunted entity, as its own character that's sort of living and breathing. And it kind of creeps you out because you're thinking about how this house feels like it's sort of consuming the characters within it, namely the main character, Eleanor. One thing that really stuck out to me while reading this is I feel like Shirley Jackson must be a strong influence on Otessa Moshveg. I, I think that is true, and I wish I had asked her more about this or at all about this during our interview, but something about her, the way that she kind of sets scenes and like on the sentence level feels very Moshvegian to me that I need to unpack more and read more of her books to kind of understand that. But this book did kind of feel Moshvegian in a way in terms of its character setup and on the sentence level of like description. There's a character actually in Death in Her Hands named Shirley. You can see that here. And so I think I piece that together while reading this. This is a card that came with the Death in Her Hands galley, which is the first galley ever receives. So I used this as a bookmark, as one does. I think I wish that the character of Eleanor here was a little bit more fleshed out in terms of her her oddity and her character of being sort of traumatized and being kind of odd and being more susceptible to the powers of the house. I wish that was a little bit more well explored here, but I do think the ambiguity and sort of oddness of her using this character as an entity was really well done and lends to the horror of the novel really well. So yeah, I finished it like an hour ago, so I'm trying to piece together my thoughts, but I liked it, not a new favorite. Let me know what you think of it and where I should go next for Shirley Jackson. I think I'm gonna read Hangs Them In, I think it's what it's called. I hear that one's really good, so I might go there next. Finally, the book that I DNF'd was Fairy Tale by Stephen King. I picked this one up in September, and I got halfway through it. It's a long ass book. I think it's like 600 pages as well. So I got like to the 300 page mark, but I ended up DNFing it, but just because I was listening on audio and why did I DNF this? I don't know, it just felt too long. Like it has all the makings of a classic Stephen King story. We have a coming of age kind of tale. We have a father son dynamic. There's a dog that we love. A really interesting kind of creepy neighbor dynamic in which this kid becomes close friends with his neighbor and kind of sees him through to his death and takes care of the dog. And then in the backyard, underneath the shed, there is a secret passageway to another world. And I kind of got to that point, but I was like, I don't know that I care. With a book that long at that point, it felt like it took so long to get there that I was like, if this is more of that, like, I don't know. I don't know, growing up, Stephen King was a favorite writer of mine, but I just don't know if I'm gelling with his stuff right now. I think I like more of his pure horror stuff rather than like fantasy. I think that's kind of what went wrong with me on that one, but DNF it for now. Let me know what the best book you read in the month of October, and I will catch you all in the next one. Bye.